Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to the TNT show, The Nation Talks. You know, it's been another great day for British democracy. Today we hear that Prime Minister Johnson is hiring a spokesperson to stand in for him during televised interviews. Uh, he's going to pay this uh, character 100000 a year of your taxpayer pounds to speak for him. Now, there are rumours, and un unverified, uh, that Jane Godley has applied for the post. And so we're all looking forward to the first time she shouts, Boris, get the door. Hello, I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60, uh, we expect, exciting minutes. Thanks for joining us this evening. We have yet another great guest, and I'm really excited that he's been able to join us. Stay tuned to hear from Scotland's foremost authority on broadcasting, and he is taking your questions. But first, a few words about TNT. TNT, as you know, stands for The Nation Talks, so in many respects, this is your show. We take your questions ahead of showtime and during the, the show live. The details are on your screen now, and if you can't use any of those, you can write to me at john at cliche.com and we'll try and fit in as many of your questions as we possibly can. And tonight, we have a first for the TNT show. We are running a poll on Facebook, and we're asking you if you agree that there should be a statue to Andrew Watson, the world's first black footballer capped three times for Scotland. And now to our guest. Tonight, the nation talks to Stuart Cosgrove. Most of you will know Stuart perhaps from off the ball. What you may not know is that Stuart has likely forgotten more about broadcasting than most people know. Stuart, how are you coping with COVID-19? Well, you know what, John, it's a very, very challenging period of time. And um, I'm, I'm actually enjoying this particular week, uh, I, I almost like a, a week off because uh, uh, my son, uh, Jack, and my partner have gone over to Aaron for a few days to a friend's cottage. And it's left me in the house alone and I can do what the hell I want. But, you know, I'm <laughs> catching up. I've got a, a big kind of... Uh, backlog of writing that I've got to do so I've been just really focusing on that and periodically going out to do the odd shop uh, at the local uh, grocery but nothing uh, big or significant and I, I, I'm actually a wee bit of a sociable loner I quite like being on my own and I quite like being in the house and just doodling around and catching up with things and whatever so th this week not bad but I tell you what there's been some uh, difficult times John because I, I had a period, two or three days, where I was really not that great at all. I was just kind of feeling very depressed about it all. And I, I'm used to having a busy life going in and out of studios and things like that. And uh, having to homeschool the wee man, who's an absolute kind of um, terrier and a, a, a force of nature, um, having to kind of get him to do anything that resembled schoolwork was quite tough. I'm not a teacher, and it was proven by this lockdown. <laughs> I, I guess you'll really appreciate teachers from now on. I guess they'll occupy a special star in your firmament. Yeah, well, they, they, they actually always have done. I've always had a, a lot of kind of um, respect for, for teachers in a very different way. And, and one thing, actually, you know, I'd never uh, thought about talking about this, but just as it came into my mind there when we were talking about teachers, I, I, I remember having a teacher. I went to a school in Perth. Uh, the academy in Perth, and my uh, teacher in my final couple of years who taught me modern studies was a woman called Miss Campbell, Lorna Campbell. Now, in a way, although we didn't use the term back then, she was a bit of a yeser. She liked talking about Scotland, about its kind of <laughs> independence and its future. But, you know, she was a huge influence on in me because she said to me once, what are the things that you're really passionate about? And I was already by then a big fan of soul music. And she started to get me reading about the civil rights movement, about the anti-apartheid movement. And I just thought, this is really exciting. I can actually study these things. And that was ignited for the first time ever, really, at school uh, by this woman who was my modern studies teacher. And we sometimes forget in Scotland that modern studies is a particular element of our curriculum in Scotland, which allows young people to explore politics 
and, and kind of the economy and issues around justice and civil rights and things like that. And it's a great, great subject and it needs to be really protected because I think it gives Scotland a real kind of point of difference from curricula around the world and it certainly meant a lot to me it made me much more confident to be able to talk and write about politics the way that i think in any democracy uh, kids should be able to do is that interesting because much of what you've said echoes what a previous guest said uh, billy key yeah you, you may recall billy was brought up in ayrshire and because it was frowned upon to use scots at school yeah. He had two languages, right, from the get-go. From yeah. the knee-high to grasshopper, he had two languages. He had Scots, which he spoke up until 9 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and then he had uh, another language, which he spoke until 4, and if he reverted to his earlier language, he got the belt. Uh, yeah. So he became proficient, of course, in both, and he, yeah. he reckons that made it easier for him to pick up languages, mm -hmm. uh, but he always appreciated uh, the fact that the Scottish educational system turned out people, whatever social area they happened to come from, it turned out people who had a, a broad grasp of lots of different subjects, yeah. which allowed them to intelligently use a specialisation later because it already covered the big picture. Yeah. And it's so much easier to focus on the specific if you know what the big picture looks like. Yeah. No, and, I, and also, I, I certainly felt that when I moved down to England, I went to university in England when I was about 17 and a half and uh, I say that because I was too young to go into the union bar I was still under <laughs> eight I managed I managed to busk it quite comfortably and um, I, I remember going down to England and because um, most of the people that I was at university with had done the A-level system in England I'd kind of in a way they were if you like specialising much earlier than life than I had been. I was still doing five hires and my six year studies and things like that. So I was still juggling maybe six, seven subjects in my school career. And in some respects, I think the generalism of that was a huge advantage when I got to university. Because one of the other things about modern studies is it allowed you to do things like uh, a project, a, a written project, a, a project of your choice. You met your teacher almost as a, in a tutorial. You had small group seminars. All of the things that are part of the rhetoric of studying in university, I'd already done for a year at school in Scotland. So I think it's just a really, really great subject. I'm a, a very, very kind of big, passionate follower. There's a couple of kind of Twitter feeds where uh, school um, teachers around Scotland run their modern studies Twitter feeds. And, and it's there to kind of encourage their kids to pick up on subjects that are about, uh, you know. So, for example, as we're speaking just now, Jeff Bezos is in the Congress in, in America being um, questioned about his business practices. That's the kind of thing that will be a tweet from, say, the New York Times or whatever. And I follow these. It sounds ridiculous. You know, as a grown man, I'm following a modern studies Twitter feed, even at this stage <laughs> of my life. <laughs> Well, it's not such a bad thing. I mean, we, we can talk about social media later, perhaps. But, uh, I mean, I, I just found it interesting. Uh, it, I mean, your, your your educational path took you through uh, your uh, degree in, in, in South of the Border. But then you moved on to the States, I yes. gather, and you took degrees there, too. Yes, I did. Um, it, it's kind of it's slightly embarrassing this bit, John, because I'm one of these people that over the years has managed to amass numerous kind of uh, degrees, some of them are honorary doctorates and things like that. And uh, I'd been to great universities, you know, Harvard, um, North Virginia State University, um, and uh, Wharton University of Pennsylvania. But again, you go back and um, we didn't, when I was a kid growing up, there was no such thing as the Scottish Parliament. But if you remember, and this is one of the things that I think a lot of people find difficult to fully understand in England, we had already an independent education system. The education system in Scotland was never part of the union. It was always something that was independent, if you like, of, of, of London. And as a consequence of that, there was the Scottish Education Authority when I was a a kid growing up, and they had this very, very attractive thing called 
a major Scottish studentship. And they gave, I think they gave three away in any given year. And I, I applied to do a master's degree in America. And um, whether it was to do with the quality of the application or the kind of things that I was wanting to study, I was given one of these awards, one of these studentships. And remarkable, you know, it paid for all my upkeep, it paid for my flights to and from America, it paid for all of my reasonable expenses. I mean, something that you just simply wouldn't hear about now. And when I'm talking about a three-year scholarship to allow you to do the basis of your PhD uh, on a full grant in the sense of my, my mother was a widow, which she had a very low income, so there was no way that I was going to ever get money through my family, but to have won this at an early age was just a big, big, big plus in my life. And and I kind of, yeah, I don't know who to thank now because they'll be long since retired, many of them probably dead, but if, they, if there's a place in heaven where the Scottish Education Authority resides, thank you very much <laughs> indeed. <laughs> so, so how did you move from there towards broadcasting and Channel 4? Yeah. Well, you know, that, that was a, a kind of thing that's kind of like odd and circuitous. I came back from the States. I'd been in and out of doing little other kinds of little jobs. I worked briefly in higher education. And I started to write mostly about uh, African-American music for a, a newspaper called Echoes. It was like a, a black music paper. And my, my work was seen by the then editor of the NME um, and uh, a guy called... Uh, uh, a guy called uh, Neil, 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 his name will come back to me, this is terrible. Uh, and he was the editor of uh, Spencer, Neil Spencer, he was the editor of the NME at the time. And he talked me into going and joining the NME and they paid a transfer fee to Echoes for me because I was an Echoes writer. So literally it was in the form of kind of free adverts and things like that. And I went over to the NME and I was writing principally about uh, black music. And because of my interest in the media and that, I also became the media editor of the NME. And that then meant that lots and lots of TV stations asked you to talk about various things, whether it was kind of in the music scene or the media scene. And it was coincidental at the time. It was a period of time they, they used to refer to it as the era of trendy telly when there was kind of Janet Street Porter and all of these people around <laughs> were slightly obsessed with having people that had what they thought authentic accents. So I was often wheeled out just to be their, their kind of, uh, you know, jock on wheels to come in and talk about <laughs> So that I ended up being on the TV a lot and then eventually set up an independent production company with a friend and colleague of mine, a guy called Don Coots. We set up a company in Glasgow during 1990. That became uh, very successful quite quickly. We produced uh, The Big Day for Channel 4 and a number of other series, Halfway to Paradise. And then eventually um, Channel 4 approached me about going to them and I, and I took that job and it was a very good move in my life because although it meant going back down to London, it gave me um, a long period of time in the heart of broadcasting and senior management and broadcasting commissioning, you know, uh, being an executive at Channel 4. And it's given me a kind of perspective on broadcasting probably, um, you know, uh, as good as anyone could get. You know, I've been in the belly of the beast, you know. But one, one thing without kind of quickly going over it, I remember coming home, and uh, you probably know this from uh, reading things about me, John, but I'd grown up in a very Scottish Labour family. My, my dad, Jack, who died when I was very young, was the uh, agent for the Labour Party in uh, Tayside, in the Perthshire and bits of Dundee area. He'd been a union rep, and my mum my was very much... Uh, um, um, the, my mum was very much... Uh, 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 Labour Party activists and everything. And so when I first left Scotland, moved down to London, I was just very much in the Labour Party. Uh, and not, I mean, not unlike an awful lot of people in Scotland, it was just simply common to me. But I do remember coming home in 1990, 1991 and 92, and I vividly remember um, getting involved quite quickly in Artists for Independence, which was a pressure group um, that was around um, with people like Ricky Ross, Pat Kane and people like that. And I became involved in that movement. And from then on, it's been a journey about embracing the thought of independence over those those decades. Um, there is a photograph, actually, it got dragged up the other day. And I can I can think I can see my shoulder in the photograph. 
It's a very, very young Nicola Sturgeon next to a very young George Galloway and a, a, a <laughs> Pat King. And then you can see another guy's shoulder, which I'm pretty sure is me, because I remember that demo. It was in George Square. And, and you just think, God, how the world's moved on, you know? <laughs> Hasn't it just? Oh, my word. See, we, we've had a couple of questions already. Uh, uh, we can perhaps come back to the, the theme of this if you want to talk to them right now or you might want to leave them for later. Uh, there's a question that's come in on email from, uh, make sure I get, I get his name, Mike Fennick. Yeah. And he's saying, can Stuart please comment on the likes of uh, RT, Russia Today, I guess, Al Jazeera, France 24, etc. Are, are they a, as free of bias as... Uh, <laughs> as other broadcasters, he, he actually names a broadcaster here, but I won't. I won't yeah. go down that route necessarily. Uh, uh, well, look, what's your take? Yeah, well, look, one, one of the things that ha has happened in the world of broadcasting um, is been what you might call uh, the miniaturisation of the means of production of broadcasting. The fact that just now we are broadcasting uh, to Scotland via you know, a, a system that's readily available has kind of changed broadcasting forever. Now, the, the origins of that, I mean, we could go back decades and kind of point to how camera technology has changed. But one of the key changes was when CNN was set up in, in, in America. And um, CNN was based in Atlanta and Georgia, and of course, became involved in the first of the Gulf Wars, and then suddenly this new 24-hour news channel was around. Um, quite a lot of the images kind of because it was kind of you know, like bombing and war and things like that. A lot of the imagery was indistinct, but you were really getting the sense that you were there and you were hearing and you were being updated. And I think in lots of ways that sense of 24-hour news or the always-on kind of media era is with us now in a big way. Uh, and so a lot of these channels, you know, and you've mentioned at three there, have changed the way in which world broadcasting works. Al Jazeera is an extremely good example of that, where they seem much, much, much more knowledgeable about the nuances of different nations within the Middle East than, say, would be the case with any British broadcaster. And whilst Channel 4 might be, Channel 4 News might be capable of doing, you know, a very, very decent piece, they're not in that area. They don't have a reporter in the Middle Middle East day in, day out, every day. So they're never going to have that kind of nuance that Al Jazeera can bring. And I think it's too easy just to jump in and say, oh, well, the, the, these channels are biased. That comes from the set of thinking that often you don't understand um, exactly the culture that they're coming from. And there are plenty of stations in the world that are funded by, you know, reprehensible people, many of them, you know, uh, quite a lot of the TV stations around the world are, are run by billionaires or they're run by the controlling instincts of a government. And there's a lot, we're seeing a lot of stuff just now in Hungary where the Hungarian government are virtually controlling uh, the media in a very direct way. So every nation has its own specificity. And I, I, I just feel that to some extent, we ought to often step back from that and say, where are their strengths in the in, in Scottish culture and Scottish broadcasting, and where are we weak? Well, one of the areas that we're getting increasingly better at is, 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 is digital media. You know, it's kind of interesting, like if you look at your own project just now, but even yesterday I noticed that, that Scotia had launched a crowdfunder. I, you know, I, 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 I work with um, the Big Light Network doing podcasts, these things are new. They're, they're, they were not. It was not possible to do these things three or four years ago. So I think that there's a lot of hopefulness there in emergent uh, media, and and maybe the days of kind of ultra big controlling broadcasters are, are top down and have maybe a kind of colonial attitude towards uh, the world. Maybe those days are disappearing. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, we've had a question from Lynn. Finlayson and Lynn is asking, Stuart, do you think Scotland should have its own independent news channel? Uh, unquestionably, I think that. I think that Scotland should have its uh, independent uh, broadcasting culture. I think that would be the right thing for any modern independent nation. And you know, if you look across the, if you look across the world, and you look at the way in which different, uh, you know, the the way in which different. Um, 
expectations are placed on broadcasters, you look at Denmark or Norway, uh, any of the Scandi countries, they all have a different broadcasting culture than the one we have in, in, in Scotland. L let me tell you a little anecdote. I remember um, that I'd been asked by a TV2 in Denmark if I would be effectively what you would have called in the university days the external examiner. I was the person <laughs> they brought in to look at their program, to talk about their head of their programs, to test which of their shows were kind of working for them and which weren't. And it was really just a, it was part of the requirement of their of their um, regulation within D Danish broadcasting. And I remember uh, arriving uh, at an airport, it was actually Copenhagen, I'd gone to the airport there to, to be met by uh, the head of programmes and I was taken to their studio. Um, now what's quite interesting about this is we did this kind of two hour workshop with him and then he says, I would love you to talk to our independent producers. And um, I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. You know, let, just tell me what you need me to do. And he said, well, we've got a helicopter for you, uh, a helicopter pad near the studio. <laughs> and then I was flown to Odenza or Unza, as they call it, and was taken in to speak to this hundred producers. And I said, why, why did I go to Unza? And the guy just simply said, we're required by law not to do everything at our HQ, and some of our best producers are based in Unza. Now, the equivalent of that is having an HQ in Glasgow and having to fly to on a helicopter to, say, Dundee or Aberdeen to talk to producers. That's actually a good thing. It sounded a wee bit mad at the time I was doing it, but I fully understood that they come under quite a lot of pressure to regionalize uh, their news output. In Denmark, they have a regional broadcast. Um, every, every hour, there's a 10 minute insert into their main news for, for regional areas of, of Denmark. Now, you know, people would say, well, you know, could we do that and all the rest of it? One of the big problems that we've got in Scotland is Scotland is a nation, but it's also a nation of regions. And I think there's an awful lot of people outside the central belt in Scotland. They don't feel that they get value from money for money from their broadcaster, whether that's the license fee or whether it's um, you know through advertised funded TV. They they just don't see their area on television enough, you know. And I think that should change. It raises the obvious question: Why isn't the BBC doing this in news and current affairs? Well, I, I think that the news and current affairs at the BBC has so many different challenges and, I, and I, I you know i think they a lot of them are real real challenges which you know probably can't be resolved within the current kind of system and setup one of the big things about it is that um news and current affairs in london is probably the the most powerful directorate within the BBC. You know, so if you look at the current director general, Lord Hall, he's worked within that directorate almost all of his adult life, apart from periods out at the Royal Opera House. And it, and it just kind of is in his bones. And there has always been a tendency to see Yorkshire and Scotland and Northern Ireland as effectively outposts. Uh, I remember when I took on the job of Director of Nations and Regions at Channel 4. The magazine that runs the broadcasting industry, or one of the big magazines, Broadcast Magazine, said in the feature, it was, there was a management change at Channel 4, and it said, Cosgrove has been pushed sideways to Director of Nations and Regions. I got a fifty grand. I got a fifty grand a year increase when I was pushed sideways, you know. Uh, and that was the time when I was being allowed to open an office in Scotland and have my own team and staff based in Glasgow. For me, it was one of the most exciting things I'd ever done in my life. But the ideological mindset was that if you're going to work in Scotland, you, you're, you're kind of going further down the food chain. BBC Scotland has to fight for that all the time. It doesn't have absolute control over its schedule. It, it doesn't have absolute 100% control over the decisions it takes about whether it does specialist uh, news at a particular time. It doesn't have an absolute uh, control of when it opts in and out of the schedule. So for example, big um, events like, for example, probably the biggest ones would have been in our lifetime, maybe uh, Dunblane or Lockerbie, these kind of epic big uh, public um, uh, tragedies or public incidents. 
you need your broadcaster and the people who are in that area to take their decisions about what's right for their viewers and not have to kind of defer that to uh, decisions taken, you know, 500 mile away in the London centre, who I think in both of those cases knew it was a big story. But there are other stories that break in Scotland, not of that scale, but deserve dedicated kind of news coverage. So, so I think that there's quite a lot of um, challenges there. Uh, I, I'm, you know, a lot of people think I'm a wee bit kind of soft on the BBC. Other people think I'm the person that speaks the truth within the BBC. But one of, one of the things is I think we're in a very complex period just now. If you look at the last white paper in the run up to independence, um, it said within it that the assets, the staff and the assets of the BBC in Scotland would be transferred over to a standalone broadcasting company called the Scottish Broadcasting Corporation, which would be a, an independent broadcasting corporation. Well, that to be in the next manifesto uh, when we go to the next referendum, and that's the basis on which Scotland negotiates uh, media independence. I want that organisation to be as well resourced and as good as it can possibly be, because it will have the basis within it uh, of what will be a new independent Scottish Broadcasting Corporation. And I know there'll be people listening to this thinking, no, no, Stuart, you're wrong. What about him? What about her? What about him saying this? And what about that? And I know all of that, but we need a really, really solid uh, Scottish Broadcasting Corporation if we find ourselves in the, uh, in the, uh, in the position of being an independent nation. Uh, that would seem to make a lot of sense to a lot of people, I suspect. I mean, the impression lots of people get just now is that the approach that they see is it could only be described as colonial. In fact, the way you describe it sounds colonial, i.e. I'm at the centre, I am omnipotent, and I will, from time to time, indulge you. Uh, but there's nothing formalised about it. Uh, it's It's... It seems to be determined by that sort of uh, mindset, which is combined perhaps, and I'd very much like your views on this, if you wouldn't mind. It, it, it strikes me it stems from a lack of democratic accountability. Uh, well, in other words, where the broadcaster reports to a, a, an entity such as the SBC that you describe, that would seem to me to be an appropriate relationship. Well, in, in every other nation, I mean, this, this is clearly, a, you know, a, a period of democratic change that we're going through. And interestingly enough, when devolution was first being imagined and when the, the process of devolving powers to Scotland, some of which we already had in areas like health and education, others of which were new powers to the new Scottish Parliament, one of the things that um, the centre, if you like, in terms of the... Uh, the mindset of what had to be maintained, broadcasting was one of the things that they were determined had to remain. Now, you can, you, you, you can interpret that any which way you like, uh, but even that has changed because in London, gradually, the BBC, which was run effectively by a, tr a board of directors as a trust, eventually came under pressure within London itself to become um, overseen and regulated by Ofcom, the Office of Communications, the regulator um, in London, which is also the regulator that oversees um, Channel 4, Channel 5, uh, ITN News and other public se uh, service uh, licences. So the BBC is now falling under that uh, area of, of regulation. There is an argument that actually broadcasting should and could be uh, devolved to Scotland. I think the time for that probably isn't now because it feels like one of the things we're going to be, have to be doing in the next few months is fighting the idea that powers we thought were there and were ours to be part of our democracy are going to be taken back off us as part of the internal market Brexit settlement. So there's quite a fight there. And I don't think now's the time when we can say, oh, actually, we want more powers. We're going to have to defend the powers that, that we've got um, whilst uh, we move towards a second referendum. Um, and I think that that therefore means that who would regulate the Scottish Broadcasting Corporation? And I, I would personally prefer, I, I'm, I'm interested in light touch regulation, 
but Ofcom are, are a very good regulator in as much as they're based on, um, they, they regulate because of kind of evidence, they're evidence-based. So if they say mobile phones are taking over uh, children's, um, uh, children's kind of uh, playtime or the time that they spend doing things, they don't just assert that, they go away and research it very deeply for six months and then come back and say, yes, it is now a matter of fact, we can say that X, Y, and Z didn't happen. And I would, I like evidence-based regulation, but I also like light touch regulation. I don't think people should be hanging over your shoulder telling you what you can and can't say on air. Uh, and so for Scotland, I would want to see uh, a regulator between the parliament and the broadcasters. I wouldn't want a situation where a politician had of, of any persuasion, uh, whether benign, whether left to centre, right to centre. I just don't like the idea that politicians are not sure there has to be some kind of interface. John, you've gone quiet on me. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, John Bacham. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm still here. Let's see how it goes. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hi. We're back. <laughs> oh, well, welcome back, John. I, I had a moment where I, I thought I'd said something that made you keel over there. No, it takes a lot to give you the vapors in my face, John. <laughs> uh, well, I hope folks that uh, when you're watching and listening, you didn't uh, didn't affect your entertainment too much. The good thing is that Stuart is back. I don't think he was perhaps particularly far away. Perhaps it was at my end. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, we're back with you again. I think the points we're making were about the uh, composition of a Scottish broadcasting uh, corporation. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it, it would seem to me that it would be terribly important that such an entity would be essentially very democratic. Uh, you know, that, that, that represents a full spectrum of, of uh, opinion. Uh, is that something you feel would be important? Well, yeah, of course, and I, 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 I feel that um, if you look actually at the producers' guidelines of the BBC as they're currently constituted, quite a lot of people jump to the whole idea about balance and objectivity and, and all of those kinds of things, and whilst they're 
an important part of the BBC's um, guidelines. There is another one that doesn't get nearly as much attention, and that's what they refer to as diversity of opinion. Because actually, you know, in an intelligent democracy, you want to listen to a show where there's a diversity of opinion, a range of opinions, people challenging, you know, because let's be honest, although, uh, you know, the people that might be watching this uh, Independence Live may share a passion for Scottish independence, it would be naive to think that we all think the same things, you know, we'll have different views on endless subjects that, you know, that we want to see within an independent Scotland. And we know that the Yes movement, you know, which is, you know, one of the kind of most uplifting things that's uh, happened in decades in Scotland, that some of that is coming from the women's movement, so women for independence, a lot of people coming from the left, a lot of people coming from environmental uh, areas of our society. So the yes movement and the independence movement is a very diverse movement and you want that kind of diversity reflected in, in, your, in your broadcasting. But here's another thought, which is one that I know... Um, uh, one thing that makes um, that makes it kind of difficult for uh, people to fully understand is I'm committed to the idea of any modern broadcaster now being a publisher broadcaster. A publisher broadcaster is a station like Channel 4, which hires all sorts of commissions, all sorts of independent producers to make its content. Because diversity of opinion in a democracy is fine, but you also need diversity of supply. You need people bringing your programs from a range of different backgrounds, experiences, places. Uh, and I think that in the new Scotland, that would be something that I would definitely argue for and advocate. Yeah. Yep, that's it. Hi, Stuart. Sorry about that. Uh, I, mean? I, th I think there was a there was a glitch on our uh, internet connection. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, we we have a very sophisticated system here, which constantly. <laughs> anyway, uh, before you were so rudely interrupted. <laughs> so the the final point I was making, John, was that I think that. Um, a, a new broadcasting corporation would uh, commission much more out to independent production. And that's not always something that makes you popular uh, with colleagues. But the Channel 4 system, which is a system based on diversity of supply, is that commissioning companies, uh, it's independent companies, are commissioned to make content, including actually the Channel 4 News, which is commissioned out on a two and three year contract. And I think that stops you having that kind of, you know, there's a, a danger within any institution. And this is not, this is not just true 
of the BBC. We know that across institutions, across our entire public life, they can become animals of their own creation. They can have their own yeah. internal behaviours. And sometimes it's a good thing to actually shift and change the way in which they are required to source content. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. It, it, talking about diversity, as you did just a couple of seconds ago there, what, what are your thoughts on the, we're having this poll to talk about whether there ought to be a statue uh, for Andrew Watson. What, what's your view? Well, um, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of statues per se, although one thing I would say is I love public art when it's creative and imaginative. And um, I think that Andrew Watson is certainly somebody that we in Scotland should cherish, should remember, should historicise, should give greater kind of knowledge to. His story should be a story that's told within our education system and you could see how that could be told within a, within a programme of activity predicated on slavery and reparations and all of those kinds of debates. Uh, and so it's a really interesting area for people to study. So I want to see him being a much more active person in our public uh, history and in, in the way in which we think of him. It is a remarkable story that a young uh, uh, black Scot should captain Scotland and be one of our greatest players of all time, probably. Uh, yeah. But the era that he lived in preceded television, preceded the kind of glamour that football now has. And so he's virtually unknown except to uh, people that are very passionate about um, Scottish history. So yes, I'd love to see him celebrated more, but maybe in the form of kind of public art or rather than kind of a, a block statue. Uh, but that's that's a kind of debate for people that uh, curate and commission public art in Scotland. Yeah. So, you know, you, you look at you look at the difference that, for example, the um, in Falkirk at the wheel, you look at the, 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 the great kind of public art that's there, has literally transformed that area as a, as a tourist yeah. attraction. And, and I think that public art can have that transformational quality. And that's how I would like to see Andrew Watson remembered rather than there being a statue in a public, in a square somewhere, you know. Yeah. I, I was having a discussion with some people just the other day there. And one of the thoughts that was that emerged was um, picking up the point you just made about uh, education yeah. and Black Lives Matter. And perhaps there ought to be one of the suggestions were, uh, amongst many others, uh, uh, was it some sort of uh, uh, essay competition, for example, right yeah. across Scotland, to encourage kids to talk and think about uh, the whole color, uh, the whole empire bit, uh, yeah. the fact that that, uh, that in many respects Watson had a very privileged upbringing. Yes. Uh, but yet, uh, uh, unlike many with a privileged upbringing, he exploited that to the to the fullest i mean yeah. and, and that lovely story about when he moved to london he was poached by corinthians yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i mean but, but, you know, uh, who could who could write about that with, yeah. uh, you know and, uh, give chance people a chance to test their eloquence yeah. when it comes to a specific yeah yeah no yeah i think i think that yeah, I think that would I think that would probably work quite well. Uh, yeah. Can we can we turn to your books for a second? Uh, yeah. And talk talk about those, Stuart. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was asking. Could we talk about your books for a second? Yeah, well, for a second, you might need four hours uh, for this, John. <laughs> uh, I, I've got uh, a number of uh, different books with, that are out there and uh, have been, you know, I, I've actually, if I, I was uh, honest with you, I've had a really, really successful um, last couple of weeks because books are not just about the writing of them, it's about all the kind of other opportunities that they throw up. So probably the biggies in my, my life just now is a new book that's coming out in the next month called Cassius X. Uh, and the preceding uh, three books, the Soul Trilogy, Detroit 67, uh, Memphis 68, and Harlem 69, they're all books about the story of soul music against the backdrop of um, the last uh, years of the 60s, 
civil rights, black power, the war in Vietnam, the, the secret state trying to undermine uh, uh, black activism within uh, the American ghettos. A whole range of really, really big uh, historic subjects and something I'm really, really passionate about. And those books sell very well, but importantly, uh, all of them uh, have been picked up by uh, producers, mostly in America, some here in the UK, with the view to them being made into either documentaries or dramas uh, within the current streaming system where Netflix, Amazon Prime and those uh, those kinds of organisations. Uh, and it's, it's kind of exciting, but I found out yesterday that the Cassius X book is going to be simultaneously published in America with a Chicago uh, publishing company. And uh, yesterday I also got news that it had been bought by um, a, a German, very big German company, and will be translated into German. So when Cassius X comes out, it's going to be in the biggest kind of marketplaces currently uh, around uh, in, in America and in Germany. So there's a, an element of kind of being proud of that, but also it helps you kind of visibly to kind of move on to the next stage of things that you want to do, you know. Yeah. Uh, and remind me again, when is your book out? A uh, book's out in a month's time. It's called Cassius X and a Legend in the Making. It's a, a period of time in 1963 when Muhammad Ali, as he became known, is beginning to convert to Islam and is kind of, a lot of people are kind of fighting over his kind of reputation, Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, his girlfriend, soul singer Dee Dee Sharp. And it's the very early days of soul music as soul music's just emerging. So in many respects, it could be seen to my hardcore fans as a kind of prequel to the trilogy, um, but it's a, it's a book in its own right. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the good thing about it is I, I get asked every single day in my life when I'm dealing with American publishers, how do you, you know, where, where's this come from? How do you know so much? How does a guy from Scotland have all of this kind of knowledge of African-American history and all the rest of it? And I just say to them, modern studies, it's a good subject. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, I mean, it seems very topical too. It seems to resonate with the... Extraordinary. Yeah, it, 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 just now. it seems to me that the the timing is fantastically. Yeah, the, the timing and the, the connection to what you might call the kind of global zeitgeist of the events that have happened in America, that you mentioned the Black Lives Matter movement, but also the kind of um, what they call uh, in America um, uh, building the breach or who will repair the breach. It's more of a kind of Christian movement repairing the breach but it's an equivalent of Black Lives Matter. And they ask the question, when all of this stuff's over, whether it's the Hurricane Katrina and the levees, whether it's you know police violence, whether it's the COVID-19 pandemic, who will repair the, 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 who will repair the breach? Who will repair all of the kind of mistakes that have been made? And, and in some respects, that's not just an issue to be asked about African-American experience. It's something I think we'll start asking uh, globally uh, ourselves about how we're all managed and how we're led uh, and in some respects although it's a, a a hugely controversial thing in the mind of some people I, I think that if you look at the way that Nicola Sturgeon's handled the pandemic in terms of uh, her, her clarity and her dedication to the cause and, and actually her you know refusal to be distracted by all the other people that are trying to distract her. It's actually a master class on how to how to run uh, your way through a, a crisis, you know. Yeah, it's been, it's been very, very impressive. Uh, she posted sniping from all sides, pretty much. Yeah. It, it takes a lot of uh, nerve to, to keep focused while you're being heavily criticised for doing what you think is an important job, but you could, you could argue that's true for every senior executive. That's what comes with the territory. That comes with the territory. If you don't want to do the gig, don't take one. <laughs> don't, don't do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we, uh, we've only got about uh, 10 minutes to Yeah. 
Até mais. You can't hear me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've got 50 megabytes here. Sorry, I was asking the question before we were so rudely interrupted by the inadequacies of technology. Uh, where you thought the independence movement was going, the Yes movement, uh, and what you thought the future of all of that was, particularly bearing in mind we've got Scottish elections coming up. Well, Sorry, Stuart, did you get that? Yes, I did, yeah. I mean, first and foremost, uh, I don't think there can be much doubt in people's mind that um, the opinion polls uh, over the last um, six months to almost a year have shown a kind of settled um, position for the, if you like, the yes movement as being comfortably on 50 or above 50 percent, which is uh, higher than we've ever been in our history. And that's uh, got to be something that we hugely welcome and, and push further and see where, where it can take us. I mean, there is, a, of course, the very well-known uh, thesis that um, quite a lot of people in the Yes campaign put, put forward, which is, it, you know, we know from uh, 2014 that this is a great grassroots movement and that they can push and communicate and nudge people further. And I think we've got another two or three percent to go. Uh, I would love to think that we could go into an independence referendum uh, with the opportunity to get 60 percent. And then, of course, it, it just simply becomes game over. But, you know, anything above Brexit will do for me. Um, and I, I, I would go further than that, uh, John. I think a lot of other things are kind of falling into place for Scotland in ways that you know, we, we hadn't ever imagined. I don't think any of us really imagined that um, Boris Johnson and uh, his uh, uh, his cabinet would be so aggressive in their, uh, and actually so poorly organised in terms of the way in which they m dealt with the pandemic. And that's given Nicola Sturgeon, whether she does or doesn't want this, it's made her to look a much more formidable uh, leader than, than Johnson. That's That's been a a big thing. I, I think there's another thing as well, which is to do with, you know, I, I, to begin with, I had a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of people that are part of the, uh, the TNT show would think, oh, you know, um, uh, what's this about Ruth Davidson being handed a kind of peerage or if that actually goes through. There's another side of me that can see a big upside in that because it's a statement of fact that the uh, government in London are completely out of touch with what opinions are in Scotland and they'll take these decisions to effectively overrule democracy because the next logical step would be to um, to put uh, Ruth Davidson into the cabinet as Secretary of State for Scotland and that would just be another very public display of not caring about the democracy. Okay.
Okay. We're back. <laughs> How are you? So, sorry about that, Stuart. We were, you were in full flow there, and all yeah. of a sudden I disappeared. And uh, anyway, we can sort that out later. You, you're saying that there might be a, a, a confluence of different factors that might help the whole process move towards a positive result. Yeah, uh, I think very much so that uh, in some respects you can see that different things are not in any way directly connected, but the idea that Ruth Davidson being fast-tracked in the House of Lords in order to kind of, in a way, uh, provide there being what in, in, what in England they think she's... Uh, uh, a big figure in the kind of um, Scottish political uh, system. Uh, and, and, and I think that that may end up looking as if they don't actually care about the democracy of Scotland. It's just another way of manipulating the system. And I think that that will not play well with... There's a lot of people in Scotland that are still kind of yet to be convinced that some of those people will be Democrats. They'll be people that say, you know, it's quite interesting that when asked the question you know, about the Scottish Parliament and its powers. As many as 80% of Scots want the Scottish Parliament to, he to be here. They want it to be relevant and they want it to be powerful. That's a huge number of people. That's much bigger than the 54% of people that say they want an independent Scotland. So that means that there's 20 odd percent of Scots that are willing to be um, convinced around the democracy of Scotland and, and our own parliament. And I think that's a big, big, big chunk of people that can be won over to, to uh, the Yes uh, movement. Yeah, I, I think... <laughs> sorry, I lost you again for a bit there, Stuart. But I, I, I take your point. You know, John, is eloquent and... Uh, uh, right on, on the button. So don't worry about that, mate. I've lost you now, John. I can, yeah. Yeah. That's happened. I mean, is it is it worth us kind of? I don't know. Is it worth us kind of bring it to a close and and seeing what we can do another day, or you know? <laughs> you want to? Right, okay. So you can hear me? Uh, uh, so I'd just like to uh, say sorry, folks. It uh, looks like there was some internet problems with, with, with John there. Um, so, Stuart, we'll just maybe bring this to an end. And then uh, maybe, we can, maybe we can do it again once we, we, we sort out the, these internet issues. Yeah, very happy to come back and do something uh, another time. So... But thank you to uh, yourself, Kevin, and to John as well. And thank you to all the people that uh, bore with us uh, during the <laughs> stop-start mechanism. I think it was even there for us to enjoy, you know. Uh, absolutely. Um, we're going to be speaking to Brian Cox, the actor, next week. So hopefully we won't have this, this problem. Hello. Hello. Oh, is that John in the background? Me? We've got him in the yeah, background. That's, that's... went back for his last hurrah. His last oh, hurrah, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll yeah. put you back on, John, and I'll, I'll skedaddle. Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, Stuart. Uh, we'll probably to wrap things up. Can you stick with all this, these technical problems? Uh, and I hope, uh, even though I couldn't hear you, that the, the audience could and, and see you. Uh, in conclusion, a very big thank you. Uh, it's kind of you to 
uh, A, be with us, be so eloquent, and and all the technical issues we've had. Uh, and I thank you for that, Stuart, most sincerely. Thank and a big you. thanks to all of you out there. Yeah. Uh, uh, tempted to stop your entertainment too much. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the TNT show to the extent that you could hear it and listen to us and watch us. We again have a formidable list of guests lined up for future shows. Uh, Brian Cox, arguably Scotland's leading actor, we hope will join us next week. Uh, just been an Emmy, so uh, his calendar, as they say, is very full. He's a very exceptionally busy man right now, but you don't want to miss this. Uh, 7 p.m. for the Nation Talks. And look out for the Constitution column in the Sunday National this weekend. This Sunday, I look at the following party that the UK has the best government that money can buy. And very importantly, support India Live. India Live Radio. Uh, it is for New Scotland and for all the news that you feel you might not be getting. If you like the TNT show, please support India Live now. And join us next Wednesday. And again, remember, it's been a great day for British democracy. Bye all.